Hi everybody, my name is Willie Strachan and I'm one of the ministers in the Camperdown and Lochy ministry team. I'm also interim moderator at St Andrew's Parish Church Dundee linked with Meadowside, St Paul's Parish Church Dundee. And I do some work for the Boys Brigade, both at the Angus and Dundee Battalion level, but also as Joint Chaplain of the 6th 8th Lochy Boys, Company, Boys Brigade Company. And I'm telling you that simply because this service is being made available to people within all of these organisations. I hope you enjoyed singing along to our opening song. The words are really appropriate for the current situation, and some of you may have heard the song before. We've now been in a period of lockdown for just over three weeks, and that is planned to continue for a few weeks more still to come. And so we come to worship in strange and difficult times. And because of the varied grouping who are having this video made available to them, there will be people with varying degrees of belief in God who are watching and listening to us. So let's all just try during the next half hour or so to find something that helps us to follow the two commandments, the only two commandments that Jesus Christ gave to us. And these were to love God and to love one another. But let's start our worship with a statement, not just about what we believe in, but also about what we as Christians would do and will do as a consequence of our beliefs. Feel free to read along with me if you want. We believe in God who made the sea and the earth, the sun and the sky, and who calls on us to live responsibly. We believe in Jesus Christ, who became human, who healed the sick, who talked to children, and who made friends with sinners. Jesus burned brightly, and he offended many, and his journey was one of life and death and resurrection, and his light continues to shine in the darkness. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who inspired the scriptures and whose breath we breathe. And we believe that God calls us to be a community committed to one another, offering a welcome to everyone, old and young, rich and poor, strong and weak. We believe that God calls us to be peacemakers, workers for justice, brothers and sisters to one another, a light for our world. Amen. And so let's open our service of worship now by listening to and hopefully singing along with that great song, To God Be the Glory.
Hope you enjoyed singing along to that one. Let's come to God now, though, with our prayers, recognising that we often get things wrong and often we mess up. So let's come to God with our prayers of confession. Let's pray. God of Easter surprises, we are drawn together by the power of the crucified and risen Jesus. Breathe into our being your spirit of mercy so that we will be ready to forgive and to liberate one another for a life of uninhibited service to other people. Friends, we are in the presence of an amazing grace. So let's, without fear, seek the Lord's forgiveness. Dear God, quite suddenly, without us even thinking about it, we do and say hasty things which we live to regret. And sometimes, God, in our willful moments, we undertake courses of action which are bound to hurt others and degrade ourselves. And then, God, because we allow our minds and our hearts to become clogged up with unrepentant guilt and pretty poor excuses, we want to come and seek your forgiveness. And so we do that right now, God. We bring to you the times that we've messed up, the times we've said and done the wrong things, the times when we could have done and said the right things, but we didn't and the times that we've hurt other people. So here now in the quiet, just between you, God, and us, ourselves, our personal confessions. Jesus Christ came and comes not to condemn the world, but to save it. Jesus Christ is our peace. Friends, it is actually all true that in Jesus Christ you are forgiven. So take courage. Inhale the breath of Christ so that you may be able to forgive yourselves and then go on to love your neighbour as you now love yourselves. Hear this prayer. Amen. Our Bible reading is from the book of Revelation in the New Testament, chapter 1, and it's a short reading from verses 4 to 8. To the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. And so shall it be. Because I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Let's now sing a song about the peace, or as it's talked about in the Hebrew, the Shalom of Jesus Christ. Our song is in Christ alone. Oh 
from the book of Revelations that we read was this. The firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings on earth. Well, what's that all about? Jesus, ruler of the kings on earth? Oh yeah. If the early Christians really believed that, then many people would say that they must have been on another planet or even with the fairies at the bottom of the garden. And they would probably think the same about us contemporary Christians. Let's just look around at those who rule the different parts of our world. The warlords of Afghanistan, the military oppressors in Burma, the Palestinian Hezbollah and Jewish extremists, the post-communist junta in China, the old com guard communists in Cuba, and of course, the beloved leader of North Korea. So are all of these under the rule of the risen and ever-living Prince Christ? And even if we came closer to home, to places like Australia, France, Russia, the UK, the USA, South Africa, India, the Philippines and Brazil, and many more nations. Do these democratically elected leaders show any sign of being under the rule of Christ? Or is that just pathetic wishful thinking on the part of we Christians? Well, perhaps the writer of the book of Revelation should take a time trip and come and live in our world and then see if he still thinks that Jesus Christ is the ruler of the kings on earth. But the words of the book of Revelation are a, di a direct consequence of a resurrection faith. Because without the Easter event, this strange yet wonderful book of Revelation, it's worth reading it, could not have ever been written. It was written because these early Christians' faith and our faith is grounded in the Easter of Jesus. It's written because God has done the improbable, no, the impossible. The Spirit of the God had been uniquely with Jesus and had placed a seal of approval of vindication that Christ's ways, his life, his teaching, and his self-sacrifice were the right ways. Only one person qualified. It was Jesus who was raised up. This particular Jesus who transcended death. It's his way of life that's vindicated at Easter. That same Jesus who touched lepers, yet called Herod a fox, the Jesus who told parables about a prodigal son and a good Samaritan and taught his followers to forgive their enemies and to pray for their persecutors. It was this Jesus who renounced earthly power and force, who challenged the authority of the religious hierarchy and cared about the poor widows and the outcasts. The Jesus who was not intimidated by the power of Caesar's representative, that Pontius Pilate. The Jesus who died forgiving those who crucified him and was buried in a borrowed grave. This Jesus is the one whom God has raised up from that grave. The resurrection is God's vindication, a mighty seal of approval of the way of the humble true man, Jesus Christ. So if God's human experiment on earth is to work out, it will be in the alignment with Jesus Christ's teachings and deeds, or it won't work out at all. There's one other thing about these early Christians. Don't for one moment imagine that they were pathetic daydreamers. They didn't live a secluded, other-worldly other life. 
out of touch with events and unrealistic about the prevalence of political cheating and violence. No, their world was at least as bloody and unforgiving as our world, probably more so. And in that Roman world, life was dirt cheap. Slavery, cruelty, and sudden death, these were all normal. Physical power lay absolutely in the hands of the Roman Empire. The army patrolled every province. So-called justice was quick and bloody, and savage executions and massacres were common. And we shouldn't forget that John, who wrote the book of Revelation, was writing his book from exile, imprisoned in the small little island of Patmos. He was definitely under the iron fist of the Roman Empire. He had no comforts around him, no support of fellowship of a congregation, no physical freedom, no friends, no reason to imagine that Rome's authority was just about to collapse. And still he writes in his letter that the authority of Jesus was greater than all the others put together. What was it he said? Grace to you and peace from the one who is and who was and who is to come and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of earth. And this was the resurrection faith of the young Christian church, based on the validity of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. Based on that, they had confidence that Jesus and his ways would have the last word. In fact, Jesus was and is the last word from God. You see, if we base our attitudes and actions on the contemporary evidence of how human authority, wealth and muscle are misused in this world, well, we're on a loser. There's not a lot of comfort out this, there in this remarkable yet highly terrible world. But our ground of hope is in Jesus Christ, that humble person of inclusive love whom God raised from the dead. And his words and his life are vindicated. The good news of Easter is the stuff that gives us ultimate confidence. Nothing we do in Jesus' name is perishable. No love offered to others is wasted. No humble service is inconsequential because we serve like Jesus in whom God has placed his trust. So let's go and do that. Amen. Let's join in the singing of a really good going song. It's called Jesus is the Name We Honour.
let's have a talk with God again. And this time, let's give thanks for all the good things that we have and also for other people who are in need at this time. We have much to give thanks for. And we thank you, God, for the resilient power of your love, which never accepts defeat and always renews our humanity. We thank you today for all the stories and events of resurrection. We give thanks for the guilty and despairing who can't see a way forward until they encounter the grace of Jesus. We give thanks for sour personal relationships that discover new life and hope through reconciliation. We give thanks for discarded employees who have put the heart and disillusionment behind them and made for themselves a new way of life. We give thanks for the gravely ill and dying who find inner peace and then go on to become the comforters of the living. We give thanks for the bereaved who sorely grieve, shedding hot tears, yet who also smile and give thanks through these tears. And we give thanks for the abused and those who are enduring unjust imprisonment, some of whom nevertheless forgive their enemies. So for everything that sings of your indomitable spirit, and for the promise that nothing on earth, nothing on earth or in heaven can separate us from your love, we thank you. Praying for others is the first step, but it is only the first step. Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit of God, we pray for a world where blaming one another might give way to trying to understand with a determination to put right the things that are wrong. We pray for our imperfect system of justice. Let jurors and judges begin by seeing themselves standing there in the dock but for the grace of God. We pray that in spite of their limitations, our prisons may be geared towards character change and restoration, and that communities may give ex-prisoners a fair go to make good. We pray for the United Nations, at a time when it's faced with the obscenity of war crimes, of the obscenity of poverty. And we pray that a great thirst for vengeance might not override the hunger for complete truth, justice, and the wisdom of mercy. Dear God, let compassion and encouragement flourish in our family life. That biting criticism for obvious faults and nitpicking over minor, war, war, minor ones and their habits of payback might not dominate the need for good. We pray for all congregations and people of faith around the globe. And so we now bring to you our prayers for other people. People that we know who are having a tough time right now. Here are our prayers for others in the quiet. All of these things, loving God, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing song reminds us of what it is that we should be doing. It's called, It's Our God Reigns. Joyfully as one 
shout for your King, your King. See eye to eye, the Lord restoring Zion, your God reigns, your God reigns. enjoyed our service today. Please join us again. And remember, stay at home, take care, and God bless all of you. Jesus said, Peace be with you. As God sent me, so am I now sending you. The busy world awaits our compassion. Sometimes we will give our best yet fail. At other times we will succeed in spite of our stumbling. So let's go gladly, daring to succeed or fail to the glory of God. And then at the very end, nothing shall dismay us. With Christ's own breath within us, we shall travel well. And so the help of the living and saving Jesus Christ, the wisdom of the living God and the support of the loving spirit be with all of you every step of the way, now and always. Take care. Amen.